Hello guys, this is the part 4 of the tutorial for SOAP, the scriptable object architecture. In this video, we will improve our spawner to spawn multiple enemies after an initial delay. We will also implement a weapon that shoots projectiles. Finally, we will create a heal pickup that can heal us and another one that gives us experience which will be dropped by enemies. Alright, let's start with improving the enemy spawner. First, let's open the spawner script and rename the delay variable to spawn interval. Now, let's expose a reference to an int. Let's call it amount and set the default value to 1. Now, in update, we can simply do a for loop that will use that amount variable. That's it. Now our spawner can spawn multiple enemies at each cycle. Currently, enemies are spawned as soon as the game starts. We would like to add a delay before it starts spawning. To do so, let's create a reference to a float and call it initial delay. And let's also create a boolean and call it is active. In update, let's use that boolean to prevent the spawning method to run if we are not active. A lot of people might not know this, but start can actually be converted into a coroutine. We simply need to replace void by i enumerator. Now we can wait for the initial delay using yield return new wait for seconds. After that, we want to set our active boolean to true. Okay, let's try it out. Let's set amount to 10 and play the game. It worked, but we had to wait 2 seconds before enemy spawned. This is because we wait 1 second for the initial delay, and because the timer starts at 0, we have to wait also for the spawn interval. To fix this, let's go in the code and simply set the timer to be equal to the spawn interval in start. Let's test again, and yes, now it works properly. One thing that I want to do quickly is to reduce the speed of the enemy as it is a bit too fast right now. Let's go to the enemy prefab and set the speed to 2. Let's make a weapon. Let's create a new class and call it weapon. Let's open it in the code editor and expose a few references. The list of enemy to iterate over. A game object for the projectile prefab and a float reference for the fire rate. We will also need a private transform for the owner transform, which is to whom the weapon is parented to. First, let's set the owner transform in awake. If we do not have a parent transform, then that means we can use our own transform as the owner. Otherwise, set the transform parent as the owner. This way, if the weapon is a child of another game object, the owner will be its parent, and if the weapon has no parent, it can still work independently. The logic of the weapon is very simple. It spawns a projectile in the direction of the closest enemy at a certain fire rate. Actually, this is similar to our spawner logic. Let's go ahead and copy the logic of the update method from our spawner class into our weapon class. Let's clean it up by deleting the isActive check and deleting the for loop. Then, let's create a local timer variable. The difference with the spawner is that instead of checking if the timer is bigger than the spawn interval, we will check if the timer is bigger or equal to 1 divided by our fire rate. This way, if the fire rate increases, we will shoot faster. Instead of calling the spawn method, let's create a new method and call it shoot at closest enemy. First, we will need to find the closest enemy from the weapon position. What is nice about scriptable lists is that because it is a scriptable object, we can add custom methods inside it. Let's open the scriptable list enemy script. Then let's add a public method. Get closest. It should return an enemy and take in a vector 3 position as a parameter. First, if the list is empty, just return null. Now, using the link library, we do a first query that orders the enemies by distance to the player. We use the square magnitude as it is more performant than to use the magnitude. Then we use a second query to select the first one, which will be the closest. Finally, we return the result. Now let's go back to our weapon. We can now use the method we just created to get the closest enemy from the weapon's position. If the closest enemy is not null, then we can find the direction, which is simply the closest enemy position minus the owner's transform position. Then we will continue the logic in a new method, spawn projectile, and pass in the normalized direction. First, let's determine the spawn point. We are going to shoot from the owner's position and in the direction of the enemy. 
we multiply the direction by 0.5 so that the spawn point is just outside of the player's radius. Then, let's set the Y position to 1 to match the Y position of the enemy's collider. Finally, we can instantiate the projectile at that spawn point. Awesome! Now that we have our weapon logic, we need to create a projectile. Let's create a new class and call it Projectile. In this class, we expose a float reference for the speed and a float reference for the lifetime. In update, the projectile simply goes forward at a certain speed over time. The enemy prefab has a trigger collider, so let's implement onTriggerEnter to detect them. We don't need to check for collision with the player or something else because we will create a new layer for the projectiles that will only collide with enemies. Therefore, we can be sure that other will be an enemy, and so we can get the enemy component directly. Then we can call enemy.die. It seems the die method is private, so let's make it public quickly. Finally, after we kill the enemy, we destroy ourselves. Let's put this logic in its own method, as we will call it again later when we implement the lifetime logic. The only thing that is left is setting the forward vector of the projectile. Usually, right after I spawn an object, I like to call a method called init. In this case, we need to pass in a vector 3 direction. Now that we have the direction, we can just set the transform dot forward to be equal to that direction. Finally, in case the projectile goes too far without touching any enemies, we want to destroy it after some time. For simplicity, I will use the invoke method, but feel free to use a coroutine or any other way to delay the call to destroy. Now we have to call this init method from the weapon. Let's go back and update a few things in our weapon script. First, let's change the reference type from a game object to a projectile. Then, after we instantiate it, let's call our init method and pass in the direction. As you can see, you can directly instantiate a class inheriting from mono behavior instead of instantiating a game object and do a get component operation. We are now ready to create the projectile prefab. Let's create a new empty object and call it prefab projectile. Let's add a sphere collider and set its radius to 0 0.125. Then, let's add our projectile script and set the speed value to 20 and the lifetime value to 5 for now. For the visuals, let's create a new sphere as a child and rename it to View. Let's remove the collider and set the scale of the transform to 0 0.2, 0 0.2, 0 0.4. Let's also create a new material and call it Projectile. Let's make it gray, then assign it to our Projectile Mesh Renderer. Let's take a look at our prefab so far. It is not pretty, but it will do the job. Finally, let's create a new layer and name it projectile. Let's not forget to assign it to our object. Finally, let's reset the position. Save it as a prefab and delete it from the scene. OK, now let's make the weapon prefab. First, let's create a new empty object and call it prefab weapon. Then, we add our weapon script and make sure to reference our scriptable list enemy. Let's drag our projectile prefab in the prefab slot and leave the fire rate at 1 for now. Let's make this weapon a prefab, and then we can move it to become a child of our player. In the previous video, we forgot to create a new layer for the enemy, so let's do that quickly. Let's go to our enemy prefab, create a new layer and call it enemy, then assign it to our prefab. Before we test all this, let's set up the physics collision matrix. Let's open the project settings, then select the physics tab. First, Let's disable all the collisions to make it clean. For the default layer, we enable default enemy and default default. For the projectile layer, we only enable projectile enemy. This way, the projectile will never collide with the player which is on the default layer. That's it, we are all set up. OK, let's hit play. Alright, we can see that we are shooting at the closest enemy. There are too many enemies though, so let's reduce their amount. Let's set the amount in the spawner to 1 for now. Let's play again. Alright, this is already starting to become fun. Something I want to do quickly is to improve the visibility of our projectile by adding a trail renderer to our projectile prefab. 
Let's go to the prefab, select the view, right click, go to effects, and select trail. To save some time, I already tweaked the settings of the trail renderer, but feel free to pause the video. You can also tweak it however you like. Let's save the prefab, go back to play mode and admire our work. It looks good. Ok, now it is time to create pickups. We will create one heal pickup and one experience pickup. Of course, there are a lot of ways to implement these, but we will do it in the SOAP way. First, we can create a new script and call it Pickup. Let's open it in our code editor. Because this will be our base class for all pickups, let's make it abstract. This class we will only do one thing, detect trigger collisions using onTriggerEnter. Let's make it virtual so that child classes will be able to override it. We can assume that all pickups will disappear after being picked up, so we can destroy it in the base method. Actually, adding experience or adding health is similar. It is basically adding a value to a float. With SOAP, we can use a float variable to represent the experience or the health of the player. Let's start by creating a new class called float variable pickup. This class inherits from pickup and overrides the onTriggerEnter method. We need a reference to a float variable, which will be the variable we want to modify. And we also need a float reference that will represent the value to be added. Now, in onTriggerEnter, we can simply add this value to the float variable and then call the base method. Alright, now let's make the experience pickup prefab. Let's create an empty object and call it prefab x pickup. Let's add a sphere collider and set it to trigger. Let's also add our float variable pickup script. We need to create a new float variable for the experience of the player. Since the new SOAP update, you can now create a new variable by clicking on this button. It will create the variable at the current selected folder in the project window. Therefore, let's select our target folder first, which is SOAP variables. Now we can click on the create button. By using this shortcut, the variable will be automatically referenced in our class. Awesome! Let's rename it to float experience. And for the value, let's set it to 20 for now. To keep our collision logic clean, let's also create a new collision layer and call it pickup. Of course, let's assign it to our object. Let's not forget to adjust the physics collision matrix in the player settings so that the default layer collides with our new pickup layer. Finally, let's add a rigid body component on the player and set it to kinematic. To detect collisions, Unity needs a rigid body on at least one object. Now, let's create a new sphere as a child and call it View. Let's remove the collider and create a new material. Let's call it X Pickup. We can make it blue and slightly emissive. Then let's drag it on the mesh renderer. Finally, let's scale the size of the view to 0.35. Let's move the prefab a tiny bit so that our player is not on top of it. Let's test this quickly. Let's select our float experience variable, press play, and then collect our pickup. Yes, it works. We can see the variable has been incremented. Great, now let's just make it a prefab. Alright, now let's make the health pickup. First, we duplicate the X pickup and break the prefab connection. Now, instead of adding to the experience, we will reference our player health. For the value, let's set it to 30 for now. For the view, let's bring the scale back to 1 and create a new material. Let's make it green and change the emissive color as well. Let's not forget to assign it to our health pickup renderer. Let's also move it a tiny bit so it's not on top of the other pickup. Let's try this. Let's play and collect our health pickup, and yes, it works. We even see our VFX and vignette effect when we are healed. Nice. There is one issue though, it is that we can heal over the max health. If we check the player health, we can see that its value is 130, but our max health is 100. That is not great, so let's fix it quickly. First, let's select our player health variable and set is clamped to true. Then, let's open our player health script. In start, we will simply clamp the current health between 0 and the max health. We can take advantage of the built-in clamping system provided by float variables. It is very useful in this case. Let's try this again. Nice. Problem solved. Now let's rename the prefab to prefab health pickup. 
and save it as a prefab. Now that they are set up, we can delete both prefabs from the scene. For spawning the health pickup, we duplicate our spawner game object and rename it to health pickup spawner. Then, we simply need to change the referenced prefab to the health pickup prefab. For the spawn range, let's go between 7 and 15, a spawn interval of 7, an initial delay of 10, and an amount of 1. Great! For spawning the experience pickup, let's select our VFX spawner and open our VFX spawner script. Let's create a new reference to a game object and call it X pickup prefab. Then, in the onEnemyDied method, we can instantiate this prefab. Note that this is a shortcut. Instead of adding this logic in the VFX spawner, we should probably create a new component responsible for spawning the experience prefab. Finally, we can simple drag our experience prefab in the new slot. Awesome! In the next video, we will implement abilities, some UI elements, and start putting the pieces of the game together. Of course, we will continue showcasing this using SOAP and decoupled architecture. Don't hesitate to leave a comment below and to join our Discord channel. All the useful links are in the description. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like and subscribe. See you next time.